We have uh, a wonderful collection of panelists here who are going to be uh, presenting. Um, Professor Anthony Angi, Lynette Seeger, and Professor Raymond Taras. And uh, the format that we're going to be following is uh, they're going to present for about uh, uh, 20 minutes, but we want to save about a half an hour uh, for question and answer. I think that's where uh, a lot of the fun stuff really is, trying these themes together. Uh, since we're starting about 10 minutes uh, uh, over, uh, I've been told to remind you that we won't have a formal break, but uh, during the question and answer period, they will have some refreshments, so if you want to grab something, feel free to do so at that time. Um, let me uh, introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, colleagues here. Um, Anthony Angi, Professor Angi has received a BA and an LLB from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He earned an SJD from Harvard Law School, where he also served as a MacArthur Scholar and the Harvard Center for International Affairs and a senior fellow in the graduate program uh, at the law school. In the summer of 1994, he completed an internship with the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. He also practiced law in Melbourne, Australia. Professor Angi joined the faculty at the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law faculty in 1995. He served as fa faculty director of the LLM program from 1995 to 2001. Uh, his areas of expertise are international human rights, international institutions, international law, uh, law and development. He has published uh, books uh, in, um, entitled Imperialism, Sovereignty, and the Making of International Law. The Third World and International uh, Legal Order, Law, Politics, and Globalization, Legal Visions of the 21st Century, Essays in the Honor of Judge Christopher Wiermontri. Our and Professor Angi will be talking about issues related to imperialism, international law, and global justice. And his, his, uh, he will be presenting on imperialism. His suggestion is imperialism has created the modern world in recent time, philosophers and political theorists have taken an increasing interest in examining international law as a means of advancing cause of global justice. And his paper will examine the different types of justice claims that have been made arising from imperialism, and he will explore the ways in which international law has attempted to address these claims, this as a means of assessing the strengths and weakness of international law as a means of achieving global justice. We will be followed by Professor Ray Torres, if I may get my information here. And Professor Torres is a, uh, um, has obtained his education from University of Montreal, University uh, in, in Political Science in 1967, University of Essex in Comparative uh, Politics in 1974. He also gained his PhD at University of Warsaw in Political Studies in 1982. Since 1996, he is a professor of Tulane University. He was a visiting professor uh, at Aalborg University in Denmark in 1999 and a visiting assistant professor at uh, University of Kentucky in 1983 to 1984. From 1997 to 1999, he was the cons consultant of uh, International uh, Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance in Stockholm. He was also a visiting fellow at such universities as European University Institute in Florence and Stanford University. His research interests include such topics uh, as subjects as international relations, Russian-Latin American relations, nationalism, post-nationalism, and identity politics. And he will be presenting a paper on uh, exploring the issues of false consciousness, uh, false consciousness in our times, globalization, and persisting attraction of myths and fabrications and lies. And I would try to sort of explain that to you, but I want to let him explain that. I think he's going to do a much better job with that. And finally, uh, our last uh, uh, discussant will be Lynette Seeger. Ms. Seeger uh, graduated from uh, Westminster College with a BA in philosophy. Lynette Seeger is a master's candidate in global justice and ethics at New York University. Uh, currently, she is writing her thesis, Political Legitimacy Reconstituted, Globalization, Recognition, and Obligation. Ms. Seeger works as a researcher for the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations and UN Women on the on meta-evaluation and the effectiveness, impact, and relevance of United Nations peace operations. 
She serves on the uh, editorial board of the Gallatin's Literary Review, a journal which publishes writing about, uh, about adults in basic education. She collaborated with Professor Dean Chatterjee as an editorial assistant and author of several chapters of Springer's recent, uh, recently released Encyclopedia of Global Justice, and she will be discussing themes of uh, global justice. So with that, please uh, uh, extend a warm uh, uh, welcome to our colleagues, and we'll start with Professor Tony Angi. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sim. Uh, let me begin by thanking um, the Tanner Center of human, uh, uh, for Human Rights uh, for organizing this conference. And uh, of course, a center consists of its people, so uh, let me thank all the people involved in this whole process, uh, Tom Maloney and uh, Victoria Medina and Alita Tu. Uh, let me also thank uh, the uh, people of the Tanner family, which founded this uh, wonderful organization, which has brought uh, so much uh, uh, enrichment uh, to the uh, university and to the community more broadly. I would also especially like to thank uh, Dean Chatterjee. Uh, Dean is a very interesting person who I think of as having at least two different personalities. On one hand, he's an actual person who's only two. Well, uh, the principal two, then let me say. But uh, I welcome your suggestions too, Ray. You're, uh, you're free to elaborate. Uh, Dean, as an individual, is a wonderful person who's extraordinarily generous uh, in so many different ways, not just in terms of his hospitality, but also generous as a colleague, as somebody who encourages uh, younger scholars uh, and other colleagues to share their work. Um, I also think of Dean as, in some ways, being a center in himself. So we talk about the Tanner Center for Human Rights, but I think of Dean as being a center uh, for intellectual development uh, in, him, uh, in himself, because whatever major event seems to take place around the university, in one form or another, Dean is involved in it, and uh, he uh, organizes speakers and persuades people to come here to Salt Lake City, and it is because of him that we've had wonderful speakers such as Amartya Sen, Anthony Appiah, and many of the people who are uh, involved in the conference uh, here today. Um, my, I'm happy to note that I'm the first lawyer to speak. Uh, so uh, in other words, uh, you know, we've had the benefits of philosophers and economics and so forth before finally, uh, you could say, uh, 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 coming to the issue of law, and perhaps that's only appropriate, because law, I think, should follow in many ways these other disciplines. And historically, this has been the case. Um, so let me uh, then focus on the fact that uh, the main theme we have to deal with here is the theme of um, globalization and the theme of justice. So I'll attempt to try and suggest some of the ways in which we could conceptualize the relationship, for example, between law and globalization in the first place, and the relationship between law and justice um, in the second place. Um, so one of the first questions we could, could ask in relation to the issue of globalization is, what is the role of law uh, in terms of globalization? Does it promote globalization? Does it hinder globalization? And perhaps the larger question we need to ask is, um, if it does promote globalization, uh, what type of globalization does it promote? Because of course this term globalization is a very large term and I don't think we can properly understand such a, a large term uh, in any comprehensive way. Uh, the second issue had to, has to do with law and justice. Um, and so of course traditionally we would like to think that the purpose of law is to promote justice. And I think this is why the role of philosophers is very important because they insist on that, connect, on that connection between law and justice. Uh, but as we know uh, all too well, law, and especially international law, is also a product of power. And so this is where I think the tension arises between uh, the potential of law to promote justice and the realities of law as being itself a product of power. This ambiguity is uh, something very noticeable even if we look at uh, the basic document of the international system uh, that as we have it now and that is the UN Charter. So if you look at the preamble of the UN Charter and Article 1 of the UN Charter which deals with the purposes of the UN Charter, uh, we can see statements which very much present the purpose of the international community as being that of promoting justice, to end the scourge of war, uh, to enable people to live in larger freedom. And then when we get to chapter six and chapter seven of the UN Charter, we find uh, 
uh, the governance structure of the UN Charter outlined, and there we find that we have these different institutions, the Security Council, the General Assembly, and it's very interesting, of course, that it is the Security Council that wields the most power. And then we have to ask the question of who is on the Security Council and who makes these decisions. So again, simply to point to the tension between power and justice. And to point to um, one way of conceptualizing law as being something that exists in the midst of this tension as having both these possibilities. Um, if we have a look at the field of global justice, uh, it seems to me that uh, it would be an interesting study to see how this field has emerged in recent times. In many ways, it is a very ancient field, of course, because the great philosophers of the past have always focused on this issue. But as it has emerged in recent times, global justice has, um, in many ways, it seems to me, been driven by the important work of various philosophers, such as Professor Richard Miller and uh, Peter Singer and um, uh, people like Thomas Poggi. What interests me is the model that is used for the purposes of developing ideas about global justice. So for example, uh, a question that is often asked in the context of global justice is, what are the obligations we owe to the poor? And what I find interesting about this is the conceptualization of the poor as being distant and disconnected from us. And so the parallel that is sometimes, I think this is, I'm not very conversant in the field of global justice as discussed by philosophers, but I've come across instances where the question is posed in the following way. There is a child who is drowning in a swimming pool. And uh, you have the ability to throw in um, a life jacket to save that child. Would it be uh, ethical not to do so in those types of circumstances? Or you have a very expensive suit. You know, would you ruin your $1,000 suit in order to slay, save a complete stranger? So there are different ways in which we, conceptual, we have a fundamental model to conceptualize justice. Um, so uh, I understand, of course, that this is a very stylized way. This is just a beginning paradigm. But I do think beginning paradigms are somewhat important. So on, that, on one hand, we have the paradigm that deals with the issue of how we theorize justice. In another context, we have a paradigm about how we start thinking about trade. Uh, and uh, for example, in the International Business Transactions book, which I use, and which is, I suspect, the most popular book uh, in American academia, uh, the sort of story of trade is told in a very stylized way. And how does trade arise? It arises in a situation where there are two continents, uh, Westia and Eastia. And the people of Westia, uh, because they have uh, uh, developed the technology that enables them to do so, travel to Eastia and discover the people of Eastia. And then it turns out that the people of Eastia have certain resources, uh, such as wine uh, or fruit. Uh, whereas the people of Westia have certain resources which turn out to be things like textiles. And then the happy thing about trade is that these two people meet, and in the course of meeting, they decide to trade with each other, and the law of comparative advantage kicks in, uh, this being something like a natural law. Uh, and as a result of this, we have a situation where both sides benefit from this particular interaction. It is one of the enduring themes of international law that trade is seen as a source of peace, whereas war is seen as, you could say, the complete opposite. So there's this interesting idea of international law, again, having this dual character uh, of dealing with this huge problem of war, um, which is enormously destructive. And the argument is we should try and focus on developing trade, because trade is a situation in which everybody benefits. So uh, to begin with, I would like to Think about those, and I understand, as I said, that these are very stylized ways of looking at uh, these issue, large issues of global justice and trade. But I would want to start with questioning those paradigms. And this is where the theme of imperialism comes in. So as I said, in the model that I spoke of, you know, the people of Westia discover the people of Eastia, and they happily start engaging in trade. Uh, there's an alternative way of thinking about that first encounter between the people of Eastia and Westia. And I thought it would be interesting to get the views of someone who was involved in the management of this encounter. Uh, if I succeed in following the carefully provided instructions on how I should, oh yes, here we are, bring up the one slide I'm going to rely on. So this is somebody who was actually in involved in that first encounter. And he says, sir, 
as I know that you will be pleased at the great victory with which our Lord has crowned my voyage. I write this to you, from which you learn how in 33 days I passed the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet of the most illustrious king and queen our sovereigns gave to me. And there I found many islands filled with people innumerable, and of them all I have taken possession for their highnesses, by proclamation made and with the royal standard unfurled, and no opposition was offered to me. To the first island which I found I gave the name San Salvador, in remembrance of the divine majesty, who has marvelously bestowed all this. The Indians call it Guanahani. To the second, I gave the name Isla de Santa Maria de Concepcion. To the third, Fernandina. To the fourth, Isabella. To the fifth, Isla Juana. And so to each one, I gave a new name. So this, of course, is Columbus, somebody intimately involved in the historical reality of that first encounter. Uh, so I think we can see some interesting themes already suggested about globalization. So this is, in many ways, if you're talking about globalization, I would say this is a landmark in the history of globalization, when you discover this new world. Um, and the interesting thing here is how he gives some sense of the medieval order. You know, you get a sense of uh, the divine presence, and then there is the king, and he pays due homage to each of these important entities. What's interesting, of course, is the first thing that he does. Now, he doesn't know where he is. He's entirely confused. He thinks he's in the Indies. And of course, why does he want to go to the Indies? For purposes of trade. So trade drove this whole enterprise. He doesn't know where he is. He sees lots of people. And the first thing he does is he seeks to take possession of them. It's a very interesting thing. So it's not a case of brave new world and those of all you know um, and all those who inhabit it. It's very interesting. If we see origins as important, uh, that first meeting as important, first impressions. I wonder what the Native American or the natives thought when the first thing that accompanies their meeting with this uh, with Columbus is that he says, "I want to take possession of you." Uh, and of course, then there is a question of how does he take possession? And then we come to the second sentence. And in the very second sentence, we find that possession is taken through the law. Law enters the picture in the very second sentence of this whole transaction, as it were. Uh, so he needs to have a legal ritual. He plants the flag. And of course, he faces a fundamental legal problem, which is the problem that would arise if Martians happen to arise, arrive here, or we happen to meet them in Mars, which is what law applies. If you have two entirely alien civilizations meeting each other, what is the common law that binds them or that governs them? So he has a problem there. Now, to be fair to him, he's not a lawyer. So the best he can do is suggest something like consent, You know, if you read this. Because he says, I unfurl the royal standard. A proclamation was made, and no opposition was offered to me. So he seems to suggest that they've consented in some way. Um, and um, once this happens, um, uh, the needs are satisfied. It's also very interesting how what he does is he seems to give the uh, natives an opportunity to speak. And then he speaks for them, isn't it? He seems to say, well, anyone got any objections? Oh, no, none? OK, in that case, let me just continue. The interesting thing is that when they do speak, and we do know from the third sentence that he says, uh, the, uh, San Salvador, uh, he says, it was called Guanahani. And then he says, but I'm going to give it a new name. So when they do exercise their presence, he sort of overrides them in some way. So in many ways, I see this as emblematic of many of the aspects of imperialism. So the first thing we could say about imperialism as it uh, emerges in these circumstances and trade in these circumstances is that it isn't a happy exchange between, you could say, equally situated people. Because what is happening in, three, in these three, three sentences is really an act of conquest. Because what is happening is that Columbus is claiming sovereignty over these people and their possessions. And furthermore, of course, uh, this is purely symbolic at this stage, but we know only too well that subsequently sovereignty really was, in a very real way, taken away from those people. So what I would suggest is that historically, there has been a very close relationship between trade and conquest. And so when we talk about parties entering into these interactions, what we are talking about is a situation of parties 
who are differently situated, but it is not an accident that they are differently situated. They are differently situated because of this whole political process of expansionism and imperialism. Let me then talk a little bit about some of the fundamental doctrines. My uh, interest is in the history of international law uh, rather than um, the contemporary issues, I suppose, so much. So let me just uh, re revert to the past. Um, so we have, in the 16th century, Spanish jurists such as uh, Francisco Vitoria talking about natural law. Now, natural law is something that we tend to think of as being very important uh, because it is the basis of contemporary human rights law in many ways. But what's also interesting about Vitoria is that he says a fundamental aspect of natural law is the right to trade. And he says this right is so important that it cannot in any way be undermined by a sovereign state. So the basic argument here was the Spanish have a right to enter the Indian lands to trade with them. And it is not open for the Indians to in any way curtail that unless, and Vitoria does have this, unless there is some harm caused to the Indians. Any resistance to this right to trade becomes an act of war because this is a natural right. And if the Indians violate that natural right, then this provides a basis for the Indians to be subject to the laws of war. And then the Spanish act in self-defense in actually remedying the violation caused by um, the Indians who are refusing their right to trade. So I would say this is a fundamental principle of international law that has been in force in many ways over the centuries. The second person I would like to talk a little bit about is the scholar Hugo Grotius, the great Dutch scholar who is often regarded as the father of international law. His great work, The Rights of War and Peace, published in 1625, is regarded as the fundamental work of international law. Um, what is perhaps not so well known is that Grotius was also the lawyer for the Dutch East India Company. So if you're talking about globalization and the law, it seems to me that we cannot overlook the actual actors that created this world of globalization. And there could be many candidates for the claim that uh, as to who created globalization. I would suggest the Dutch East India Company would be quite a prominent candidate. This occurred to me when um, I happened to spend some time in Ithaca in spring, uh, which means uh, January to April. And one of my friends persuaded me to travel from Ithaca to Toronto at the end of January. Uh, this is not a wise uh, move, I realized later. And I realized this particularly when we had to take refuge in this little place up in upstate New York. And the name of that town in which we took refuge was Batavia. And I thought to myself, what am I doing in Batavia, in upstate New York? And the reason I found this complicated was because Batavia, of course, is the name for Jakarta. So it was the, the Dutch East India Company that, that had actually explored upstate New York and settled upstate New York, doing what Columbus had attempted to do, which is to find the Northwest Passage. When Henry Hudson explored the Hudson River, he was doing so as an employee of the Dutch East India Company, which later was transformed into the, into the Dutch West India Company, when they realized actually there isn't a way through. But what I'm basically saying is that this was a corporation. And it created this vast network which spread from Jakarta to upstate New York. And the interesting thing was that Grotius was the lawyer who provided the legal doctrines that were necessary to justify the corporation in its actions in all these different entities, in, in all these different places. To Grotius himself, Grotius relied on Vitoria's claim, the claim that the right to trade is absolute and no sovereign could in any way derogate from that right to trade. How many minutes do I have? Five, five, five more minutes, okay. Um, I could also talk about various other, sc other scholars, such as Vattel, who was very important for American independence, because when Benjamin Franklin and the Founding Fathers wanted to find out how do we become a sovereign state, the person they read was Vattel. Uh, the New York li Public Library is owed $300,000 by George Washington, because George Washington borrowed, Vattel's, uh, borrowed the li New York Public Library's copy of Vattel and did not return it. Uh, so these are the fines uh, that were actually calculated. Vattel basically argued something like, um, I don't have time to, I guess, go through all his works in very much detail, but what he basically said was something like, there is a natural law which prescribes that people must use the land which they occupy. 
If they do not use that land productively, then that land can be taken from them. So again, what we see is a situation where sovereignty depends on an economic status. It's something like, but I'm running out of time, so I guess the quick summary would be use it or lose it. And this was used as a basis, in fact, you will find this doctrine being cited in American cases as one way of justifying how land can be taken away from Native Americans. Because these are people who do not use the land productively in terms of agriculture. So I just want to talk about, mention those three different basic ideas which I believe have driven globalization over the centuries and which find their contemporary uh, counterparts now. So this is why I feel that we need to bring imperialism into the picture because imperialism suggests that it is not coincidental that some people are poor and some people are rich. There is a structure of power that is in place and which is entrenched by international law in various ways which ensures that some people are poor and some people are rich. Now this does not condemn them to being forever poor or forever rich but there are those structures in power, of power in place. If we see the model in that way, then our concept of the duties that we owe these people would surely change. Because if it is the case that our wealth is in some way attributable to their poverty, and that we have to maintain the legal structures that ensure this, then it becomes a somewhat complicated issue. It is also a somewhat complicated issue in terms of the whole question of trade, because it seems to me that if we look at these interactions, there are so many instances where trade was actually in something, in in something done by force rather than something done by free equal parties. Uh, I was also, also going to talk about the Treaty of Nanjing, which was the British East India Company wanting to deal with the trade imbalance between China and the British Empire. The Chinese said something like, in the 18th century anyway, the Chinese said, we don't want your cheap, dangerous goods entering our market. And the British East India Company took um, offense to this. And uh, the British East India Company's way of trying to deal with this imbalance was by selling opium to the Chinese. The Chinese, for some unforeseeable reason, found this uh, to be objectionable. They objected to it. And then the East India Company went to war. And what is important in all these circumstances is, th is that corporations, when they go to war in these circumstances and they find themselves unable to deal with the problems, call upon the state. So England has to get involved in this conflict. So uh, it would be, it's clear to me that trade, in, at least in the historical particular circumstances I can think of, was something that was empowered by conquest, and it was something that was empowered by the state acting in connection with these powerful economic interests. I've run out of time, so I won't uh, say anything further. All I'm going to say now is that imperialism has taken a new form. It is no longer a case of poor countries and rich, uh, rich countries alone. I think you could say economics has now taken a form where the paradigm we should be thinking about is rich people and poor people. There are rich people in all these different countries, even if they are supposedly poor countries. And there are poor people all over the world, including in the United States. And I think if we understand the way in which law is used in a way to entrench those inequalities, and if we see the model as being rich people and poor people, rather than rich countries and poor countries alone, we might develop a different idea about the role of um, uh, how we should theorize justice. The final thing I want to say simply is, the dangerous thing about making these rules is that they are now going to be used against the West. So it's fascinating to see the way in which China, for instance, is using the rules of foreign investment that were shaped by the West now to further their own interests and say the same too with the laws relating to international trade. The complication is that we set a model for the world, but we set it in a way that we don't always intend. So the same argument, I would say, can be made about preemption. We think preemption is a good idea in a situation where we see ourselves as endangered. What would happen if that principle is universalized? We see drones as a good idea because it seems to protect us. I really wonder what is going to happen when many of the other dictatorial, many other, many other regimes, many of them dictatorial, start using this model as a way of conducting wars. So these are some of the complicated ways in which we might think about these themes of justice, imperialism, and the law. I've gone, gone on too long. Thank you very much. Okay.
it's also my great pleasure, along with uh, all the other speakers, have acknowledged the, their gratitude to uh, to be here, and I want to echo uh, the uh, the names of the people that. Uh, that uh, Tony has identified, and several other uh, participants have already identified for uh, supporting for supporting this uh, uh, this enterprise. Uh, what strikes me uh, so far about this uh, this conference is this extraordinary erudition of the speakers, um, and it's rather intimidating to be up here. So uh, I'm going to have to begin by uh, acting erudite. And um, I'm going to refer to a, a small a dinner I once had with a Sir Salman Rushdie, uh, uh, over which he, he said to me uh, and to the three or four other people that were um, hosting him in New Orleans uh, that um, he believed that politicians almost never use words uh, to tell the truth, uh, but novelists always did. Uh, and. Um, I think that has uh, something to do with uh, why I take the approach I do in this particular uh, paper about false consciousness. It's about uh, a word play that uh, can lead to illusions uh, that serve uh, the interests of one particular group uh, at the expense uh, of another. A, a little bit about, about what, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to do in this paper just uh, in case uh, I, I run out of time. Um, I'm a political scientist, uh, but I have uh, done a lot of uh, work uh, in, in, in cultural, in cultural uh, theory. I was the director of the uh, Tulane World Literature Program for a few years until uh, Hurricane Katrina and ended uh, that. Uh, my approach, uh, I tried to be uh, interdisciplinary, I tried to be um, multivariate, using a lot of factors, uh, because one factor will never explain anything. You can't prove causality using just one factor. I, and in this paper, I think uh, if I'm guilty of something, of, of, if there's a fatal flaw, it's of a multi-conceptual, uh, a multi-conceptual approach. Uh, I, it's, it's not really very empirically grounded, but that's because I've spent quite a few years recently doing a lot of empirical research, and uh, uh, that can be found uh, elsewhere. Uh, the normative approach, I would probably describe it as largely a communitarian. Uh, it's, it's not Marxist, uh, though I refer to uh, some Marxian uh, ideas here. Um, I, I take heart and will ride the coattails of uh, our two uh, keynote speakers, Richard Falk, who authored a book called Predatory Globalization, uh, and uh, Richard Miller, who wrote a book uh, called Globalizing Justice. So those are the coattails I want to ride in my uh, kind of communitarian approach to the uh, issue of uh, false uh, consciousness. And uh, one final thing is, what's the purpose of all this? Well, I, it's very rare I hear anyone talk about, uh, use this word, uh, it's one of my very favorite words in politics, and it's the word contestation. So uh, Richard Miller used it uh, repeatedly a few hours ago, and it's a word that's very dear to me. Uh, it's dear, to be honest, than uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, f very uh, prosaic notions of democracy when it means simply electoral democracy. It's, it's challenging ideas. Uh, that, uh, it's, ch it's challenging conventional wisdom. So uh, very quickly now to, uh, to, 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 the, to the paper, um, a, a once discredited, uh, a now discredited ideology um, held that uh, subordinate classes, we can call, including them of course the poor, uh, may be less aware of their objective interests uh, than the ruling class. Ruling class is a cliche, we can talk about political or economic establishments and so on, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not, I don't want to be tied down in definitional uh, issues uh, at, at, at this point since this is very much uh, intended to be a working paper. Um, in other words, members of the subordinate class are more susceptible to false consciousness, uh, distortions, uh, errors, uh, systematic misrepresentation of dominant social relations. Their imaginaries of the social relations around them conceal or obscure uh, the realities of their subordination, their exploitation, uh, and uh, their domination. Now, just because Marx, Marxism is effectively um, um, moribund uh, doesn't mean that an idea that he uh, he uh, 
didn't explicitly employ, but uh, launched a false consciousness necessarily disappeared with uh, the end of his ideology. Um, the objective existence of false consciousness should not logically be predicated on Marxism's external validity. As with other ideational structures, liberalism, democracy, nationalism, the sets of concepts uh, internal to them ebb and flow, give, are given greater importance at some periods of time and, and less than at other times. Um, they're oftentimes revised and modernized, uh, and only rarely do, do, do these ideas wither away. So we can safely assume that false consciousness persists, though in uh, new variations, and that's why I'm searching for uh, new concepts or, or, let's say, reinvigorated concepts in order to try to uh, flush out what, what type of false consciousness uh, exists uh, today. Uh, I want to also uh, mention uh, that the common good enters into this, uh, into this paper as well, because I think false consciousness is a way of uh, not really being aware of what the common good, uh, what the common good is. Um, it's, a Mar it's a Marxist concept, concept refers to the hypothesis that uh, oppressed people have a worldview that systematically conceals the reality and the causes of their oppression. Um, Marx emphasized the importance of a class being for itself as well as uh, in itself. And that's uh, a, a, a kind of a, a requirement of being a class for itself uh, is uh, when it is aware of its own objective uh, interests. Um, a class for itself, for itself comprises individuals conscious of sharing a common social situation who unite to pursue common interests and a common good, I would add. Um, I include uh, the definition of the common good uh, that um, I learned uh, in high school, uh, Jesu Jesuit high school, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Marx, Karl Marx showed no familiarity with the writings of Thomas Aquinas. So he wrote, there are different levels and orders among communities, and the final one is the community of the city-state, ordered to provide the things which are sufficient by themselves for human life. Hence, among all human communities, this is the most perfect. The city-state is most, most important, uh, more important than uh, all the parts that can be known and constituted by human reason. So the higher good of the state, rather than the higher good of a, a social class, would have uh, obviously evoked objections from Karl Marx. The highest good for Aquinas, uh, the happiness that a community of Christians experiences in encountering God, would have triggered Marxian references to opiates. Um, a common good defined in statist and religious terms would have suggested to Marx a, a condition of false consciousness and hallucinatory illusions. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, libertarians would side with Marx in uh, rejecting a common good understood um, in, uh, in this way that Aquinas uh, did. Um, I, uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of the uh, second and third generation Marxist thinkers, as fascinating as they were. Uh, for example, uh, Lukács in Hungary and Gramsci in Italy. Um, I think that uh, describing some of their main ideas would uh, put uh, Sanjay and all his new school students to sleep. Uh, so they certainly would put uh, the rest of us to sleep uh, as, as, as well. There's, just, there's no cachet in quoting, uh, uh, certainly, Lukács anymore. Uh, Gramsci is still around. What I, I would want to flag is, uh, is Walter Benjamin, simply because he, has, he was a member of the Frankfurt School and hasn't received his due uh, uh, worth. Uh, his overriding concern spanning many different areas, including film and art uh, and politics, um, now, was with the dangers of conformity. False consciousness has to be understood today in, in connection with uh, conformity. So I quote from Benjamin, in every epoch the attempt uh, must be made anew to wrest tradition from a conformism that is about to overpower it. 
False consciousness was never explicitly tied by Benjamin to conformity, but constituted uh, a problem in itself. When matter, uh, material, uh, material uh, matter is not prioritized, false consciousness is bound to uh, result. I am not going to get into the base superstructure, material conditions, material conditions of existence determine uh, ideas, social consciousness, and so on. But that's one of the issues that Benjamin uh, took, uh, took up. I'll, I'll skip ahead to Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu, who wrote in 1980 uh, that uh, rather than false consciousness, a very uh, 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 a preferred term might be misrecognition, misrecognition, um, because it went beyond the intent by a social class to carry out uh, conscious manipulation, such as of, 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 of the bourgeoisie exploiting and fooling, um, pulling the wool over the eyes of, uh, of um, of ex exploited classes. Um, and so uh, misrecognition embodies a set of active social processes that anchor taken for granted assumptions into the realm of social life. And crucially, they, uh, they, these, uh, these ideas are born uh, in the midst of culture. Uh, all forms of power require legitimacy. All forms of power require legitimacy. And culture is the battleground where this conformity uh, is, uh, is contested, is disputed. I think uh, as I uh, think of this, as I, as I reflect on this panel, the, the correct, the more accurate title for this paper ought to have been uh, The Power of False Consciousness and the False Consciousness of Power. So this is really what I've been trying to uh, work, work out here. Uh, and so uh, I come to this, um, oh, and I also want to uh, identify the role of intellectuals in this process. One of one of the very formative um, writers uh, that um, that I read uh, was Nikos Poulantzis, uh, uh, who um, who talked about the role of the intellectuals um, in um, in uh, in public life, um, and um, and he talked about state enrolled intellectuals who are formally distinct from the bourgeoisie, but play a role in organizing its hegemony. So when I think about globalization uh, and uh, think about the ideologues, uh, uh, the intellectual class uh, that uh, ha gave us reason to believe globalization was going to deliver on the promises that had been, uh, had been crafted, um, I think these people have to be implicated as well. Yes, I have a grudge. I was a, originally a Sovietologist. The Soviet Union fell apart. We got a bad rap. I think it's time for people who studied uh, you know, international political economy to take responsibility for getting uh, a, a small, uh, a, a, a today's small problem of a world financial crisis. I think it's time to hold them to account as well. Okay, economic uh, neoliberal glo globalization. Luckily enough, I can skip very quickly through that. This is one area that I, am, I have not written about, uh, uh, done much research in. Uh, uh, I don't feel I have any comparative advantage. And luckily, uh, over the last uh, uh, something like 20, 24 hours, we've heard a lot of very interesting, insightful uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, in, uh, sort of uh, and uh, critiques of, of, of especially economic uh, globalization, especially the issue of poverty, as and connected with globalization, I think that really that really says it's such a stark contrast uh, that uh, it's not really very important to elaborate any further on on that. Um, I also was very uh, interested in what. Um, Richard Falk said yesterday about cognitive landscapes that end up being muddied deliberately uh, uh, because of uh, lobbying groups that he cited the case of uh, the cigarette industry would 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 make would obs would obscure that uh, that the, the 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 fact the evidence that smoking produces lung cancer. He suggested that the same thing is happening today uh, with uh, climate change. And I think the same can be said with globalization uh, as well. There was a lot of uh, obscu uh, up, 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 sort of obscuring of the real nature of globalization. The, the, the problem with uh, globalization from my perspective is that the public came uh, not only to obey Big Brother, uh, the globalizing class, but to love Big Brother. So that's where the false consciousness uh, is uh, is important in my analysis. 
So oppression, exploitation, inequality. I would even add, uh, although it would, it would have, it would require a very, uh, very forceful argumentation to support this, the clash of civilizations. All of these, and, and, and I hold, I, I, I would say that's the case simply because of a contact theory that would say, would, 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 would indicate that people, when cultures, when they are in contact with each other, in closer contact with each other, rather, rather than these inter, intercultural encounters harmonizing relationships, actually antagonize them, exacerbate uh, relations between very different groups. So that could be a, uh, an inadvertent, uh, un, unintended, I'm pretty certain, uh, 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 sort of offshoot of, uh, of globalization, this clash of civilizations. Concentrated benefits, diffuse costs. That's what globalization uh, delivered us. And uh, why the 99%, a large proportion of them were willing to accept uh, and go along and acquiesce and endorse even, uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to understand. Um, the, the practical acts, aspects, of, I'll end this, uh, this very brief section on globalization, the practical aspect is that, um, that uh, as, as um, Tony just, uh, oh, uh, I think, no, as Richard was uh, suggested uh, just a, a little while earlier, I mean, China has become the, 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 the biggest beneficiary from globalization. I, I'm a Canadian, and um, the Stephen Harper, our prime minister, was uh, in, uh, in China uh, about 10 days ago signing a lot of trade agreements. Uh, and he was surprised, taken, uh, taken off balance uh, when the Chinese were suggesting an absolutely full-fledged free trade agreement between China and Canada. So what was previously in the interests of Western countries, uh, free trade, is now backfiring when, it's, uh, when the chief beneficiary uh, is, uh, is uh, the People's Republic. And so Harper has come back to Canada and told the Chinese he'll have to study the proposal for a full free trade agreement between Canada and China. Uh, transnational identity is another uh, issue that I think is an example of false consciousness. Um, and I especially focus on European transnational identity, uh, which has really gone uh, amiss. Uh, most Europeans in surveys will uh, sh say that they identify with their nation before they identify with, uh, with Europe. It's only got worse. The cleavages that I've been researching uh, between East and West Europe, but now North and South Europe are getting more and more profound. Uh, and the end result is uh, a transnational European identity is regressing rather than uh, progressing. So the, the fundamental European idea of integration is in crisis. There is more acknowledgement now of a multi-speed Europe uh, with Germany calling uh, the shots. But one other aspect of Europe's transnational identity is that it may actually be based on a normative framework that privileges fear. Uh, and even uh, certain types of uh, antipathies and outright hate, hatreds. Um, and I'm thinking in Western Europe, largely the immigrant societies of Western Europe of uh, anti-immigrant, especially Islamophobic sentiments. And in Eastern Europe, a lot of the uh, return to long held uh, 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 dispositions, including, for example, anti-Russian sentiments, which, are, which continue to be very, very pervasive uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So a, a Europe united normatively, normatively on the basis of fear of foreigners, no wonder the European Union has lost uh, its role as an international normative power. Uh, and then the, the last type of false consciousness deals with um, uh, mi migration and multiculturalism. You can separate the two, but very, very quickly uh, regard, with regard, regard to migration. Um, there's a ba basic recognition right now that migration into Europe uh, and to uh, a lot of societies, Canada, Australia, I've looked at the point system operating in each of these countries. The whole idea is that more and more barriers are, putting, are being put up to uh, limit uh, immigration. In 2008, European Union uh, member states signed uh, a, a pact on uh, European immigration uh, and asylum seeking. That was, and what it recognized was, first of all, the, the, the role of state capacity. State capacity is important in determining how much immigration can uh, can be t can can be accommodated. Uh, until 2008, uh, 
apart from some right wing uh, uh, p political parties, no, no one would dare say that immigration had anything to do with any issue other than providing people with the universal rights to migrate. So that's already recognition on the part of the European Union of uh, factors other than universal rights in determining the scale of, uh, of in-migration. Um, I, 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 I emphasize the interests that are involved in, in keeping migration high. Uh, various types, and I, I, I can enumerate them, I won't, but there are various economic interests, you know, agricultural businesses, uh, construction industry, the uh, real estate industry, there's a long list, the judiciary in many, immigration attorneys, there's a long, long list of, um, of interests uh, that uh, seek to promote uh, Im immigration. Uh, and it's it's not to say that 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 they're necessarily wrong. It's to say, as was said uh, a little while ago, that they, there's there there's there, there's this, the commercialization of of these um, of these needs uh, is um, an important factor that it never appears um, in. Uh, in, in public consciousness, the commercialization of immigration, the, the existence of an immigration industry, the, uh, the acceptance that some groups, some interests, some businesses win and others lose, uh, depending on the scale of immigration, is, is not really debated very candidly. Uh, and the end result, therefore, is that, uh, that the commercial interests in uh, keeping immigration at a high level uh, seem to uh, dominate. There are emotional stakeholders, of course, who have no material interest uh, in larger migrant flows, uh, but believe it's a moral humanitarian issue that requires a, a welcoming open door inclusionary uh, policy. Uh, and uh, I include in this paper, but again, can, will not read it out, uh, some really outlandish uh, attacks uh, that are launched against immigration that really uh, are the, the work of xenophobes, uh, of uh, uh, very often racists, um, and uh, but also of some of the defenders. Um, for example, I'll read this paragraph out. Closer examination of the principal pragmatic arguments for taking in immigrants shows that they bear similarities to those once made for slavery. Expanding the labor pool is an object, objective of immigration supporters today, as it was for the advocates of slavery in the past. Doing jobs no one else wants is a common theme. Reducing labor costs, in the case of slavery having no labor costs, uh, passing on a portion of the savings in the form of lower priced consumer goods, uh, all of this was justified uh, in, uh, in, in, in the time of slavery, and it's being justified in, the term, in time of bringing in low-skilled uh, uh, immigrants. Again, I don't, I don't object to, uh, in any way, normatively to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to uh, regulated uh, Im Im immigration. One of, the, one of the things, what other aspect of our social life would we simply agree not to regulate? It, hard, hard to believe that, there were, that, that, that immigration is, is this one area that seems not to have been regulated. My bottom line anyway when it comes to migration issues is it's dying the death of a thousand bureaucratic cuts. And here too I can enumerate dozens and dozens of measures taken in Sweden, in Germany, in Britain, in France, all to do with making certain that fewer immigrants uh, are able to arrive. Three major ways that our immigrants arrive, one is through asylum, another one is family reunification, which is right there in the United Nations uh, charge, uh, uh, Declaration of Human Rights, so that's untouchable. Uh, but also through, um, through enrolling in, uh, enrolling in uh, university courses, any type of course, uh, educational uh, courses. So in the case of Britain, the number one way that people in, come to England and stay in England is, is on the student visa that entitles that student, even though he or she is enrolled for a short course that leads to no degree, no diploma at a bogus college, that, that, uh, that person receiving the student visa is entitled to bring in family members. So that's what the British bureaucracy has cracked down on. I can give similar examples in the case of France recently. The French interior minister has said even racist uh, uh, things about not all cultures are of equal value to justify some of the, some of the measures taken there. So I want just honesty in our immigration debate, and I, I would like to see a candid debate. Right now, we are living in a state of false consciousness.
Uh, multiculturalism, uh, and, uh, and I'm done. Global migration has largely been uh, south-north, but also, of course, south-south. It's reached unprecedented numbers. It means that many societies, receiving societies, have become extraordinarily diverse. Um, I remember reading a wonderful novel by um, Vatsanji on East Africa, and it just made me want to go to Dar es Salaam because it sounds like the most multicultural, uh, natural state of multiculturalism anywhere on the face of the earth. Uh, and that, that you don't have to have uh, sort of a false consciousness of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a multiculturalism that doesn't really exist, where you have second and third class citizens, as is happening. My, and I'm largely confining my remarks to Europe. Um, so um, mu multiculturalism has been under attack. You're familiar with the headlines. Um, and. Um, there are some extreme uh, at, at attacks on, on, multi, on multiculturalism uh, that are included in my paper, but, but basically um, immigration is dying the death of a, a thousand bureaucratic cuts, cuts. and in addition, uh, in a decade, two decades from now, um, migrants will prefer to go to East Asia to get well-paid jobs uh, than to come to Europe. So I think for a lot of reasons, the issue of migration into Europe and the multicultural model, which is, which is just not a vote getter anymore, uh, are, are dead issues. But that makes it all the more, that punctuates why there was such false consciousness to believe that migration would solve all our problems uh, in the same way that, logically, the arguments in favor of slavery was supposed to solve all our problems. My conclusion, therefore, is the need to have open debates about uh, these taboo issues that involve uh, a pervasive false consciousness to serve the interests of a particular uh, class. Uh, we have to address these problems. Um, I, 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 I'm not an economist. My sense, uh, I am a political scientist, my sense is that uh, the Greek bailout received the full attention, the undivided attention of European leaders. Uh, and that's a type of priority, uh, this f focus on a major problem and resolving it that has to go into some of these ideas of false consciousness that are creating problems for us uh, as, as well. So, this, um, so I completely I like this, uh, this, this idea of uh, a mor moral advocacy that favors a, a, grace, a, 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 a graceful uh, decline because it sort of gets your priorities right instead of ignoring these important issues. And so in, uh, in, in sort of uh, analytic methodological terms, what I've done is set out a series of analytic tools to try to construct the grand ideas of our post-Cold War era. Another, very few of these ideas were false uh, examples of false consciousness before uh, the, uh, the socialist camp completely disintegrated. Uh, and. Um, um, and and, and uh, tease out the role that is played in governance structures uh, by uh, by uh, various uh, interests, including intellectuals who justify uh, uh, justify public policy that is not in the interests that is not in the common good of large sections uh, of the population. Conversion to an uh, conformity with hegemonic ideological structures form the process that leads to widespread false consciousness. The financial crisis that uh, uh, surfaced in 2008 has permitted millions of citizens around the world finally to perceive clearly how the dominant grand ideas uh, of, uh, of the post-Cold War era have not served their interests, uh, but those of transnational economic and political elites. We do need cognitive clarity in order to make responsible public policy making. We need to contest uh, false truths. It's bad policy wrapped in false consciousness uh, that we have to eliminate if we're going to approach a common good. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everyone at the Tanner Center and everyone involved in organizing the conference for inviting me to participate and for doing such an excellent job. Also, I'd like to thank Professor Taras and Angi for their 
insightful comments, and I hope to just offer some additional points that can contribute to our panel. I'd like to begin with a descriptive claim, or an observation rather, that in some ways seems obvious, but I think is neglected in discourse revolving around issues of global justice. And that's simply that our social, economic, and political lives are inextricably linked and expressed through overlapping and mutually constitutive spheres of both the local and the global. We experience overlap in the transnational movement of people as guest workers, immigrants, exiles, refugees, and through human trafficking. Communal borders are breached and people bonded through technologies in travel and media that are relatively inexpensive and widely accessible. We are all inextricably linked through the global economic order, which plays a pervasive role in the degree of protection and human rights satisfaction which workers receive, the opportunities for trade, the meaning of development, the conditions for international lending, and even the opportunities for trade. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> even the structure of priorities and governance within states. The legitimacy of political actors are measured and contested internally and externally through international law, through international norms that are negotiated through treaties, and also through global civil society, which includes NGOs, religious communities, individuals, and the media. Finally, humanity is bound through our shared problems and projects, such as ecological challenges, the transmission of disease, the promotion of health, and specialized coordination in arena in, in arenas such as civil aviation, which we couldn't function without. So in short, when we speak of globalization, it's something that occurs and is constructed within the local and informed by it, and then also outside of the local in these other domains. Um, and it's a complex system. So moving from the descriptive to the normative, we find that political theory which prioritizes the recognition of states and state sovereignty as the primary unit of concern relating to issues of global justice, um, such as we find in the influential work of John Rawls, dominates the structure of global governance and the popular imagination of how global justice ought to be achieved. Statism of the sort that I mention in negotiating the terms of global justice gives undue legitimacy to certain behaviors and practices in global interactions which violate norms that we have reason to value, such as equality, the right to consent to coercive forms of governance, and entitlements and basic freedoms. The negative consequences of statism are expressed in practices of multinational corporations taking advantage of human labor exploitation and slavery in states that don't enforce human rights or positive labor standards. We also see, and as Angie's work has um, eloquently demonstrated, that there's structural violence built into the international order um, under status principles, powerful states are justified in negotiating the best possible terms to promote their interests at the expense of people in weaker, poor, or corrupt states, lacking access to and control over vast economic and intellectual resources that wealthy states enjoy. Poor states are compelled to accept whatever terms wealthy states may insist upon, and wealthy states are morally abdicated of their moral culpability in perpetuating and sustaining systems of exploitation, uh, human insecurity, and conflict. So in short, the normative and the practical consequences of statism uh, have been produced and reproduced, and inequities are built that were built during colonialism continue and are expressed especially through the alarming gaps between the global rich and the global poor. The question then is how do we over or how do we negotiate global justice in a way that overcomes the problems of statism without falling into the traps of imperialism and the imposition of grand narratives? Uh, so I think that we can achieve this in a number of ways that need to be more fully worked out than I'm going to today for this panel, but I will mention a few helpful ideas. <coughs> So following the work of Amartya Sen, I argue that when pursuing ideals related to law, development, governance, and norms, we ought to reject the notion that our values are fixed and closed and non-negotiable in how they are understood and pursued in both 
local and global spheres. This move demands us to step outside of notions of institutionalism, nationalism, and perfectionism, and to appeal directly to understanding through value commitments, as well as practical, consequential considerations, the needs and desires of persons, groups, and institutions that come to light through robust discursive processes. In this way, we can move beyond narrow engagement with states and beyond the narrow construal of interests as contained or adequately represented by the state or interstate structure without displacing or mitigating the importance of states themselves. The challenge we face is to recognize the complexity of globalization rather than to define it. And um, too strict a commitment to definitive terms of justice risk neglecting injustices that fall outside of the pre-configured ideal and then crowds out potential resolutions or problem solving that um, otherwise just won't be addressed. Um, I think that this also relates to much of Professor Taras's concerns regarding uh, false consciousness and globalization as false consciousness. I think that it's important to understand that globalization isn't a monolithic process. It's not a monolithic term, but it's really this robust and alive human construct. It's something that we experience. It's something that we create. And it's normative and it's practical and consequential. And so, it's important that we address the concerns that some overarching narrative of neoliberalism or things like that um, are imposed in a way that's not productive, <laughs> but rather, um, but I just think it doesn't help to have use grand narrative or, or to underestimate the complexity of what it is that we're discussing because that in the end will undermine what it is that we're trying to achieve. And I think that I'll just add, you know, maybe as to further that point, um, the idea of cosmopolitanism can be seen as a threat to reproducing systems of imperialism and domination because it sort of attaches to it the notion that there's one way, that there's an ideal system that we should follow. But the reality of it is, is that it's a very complex theory and it's one that a lot of theorists in varying traditions have adopted. And um, so to take the heart of the notion, which is really that all human beings are deserving of consideration and that our first commitment is to humanity as a whole doesn't undermine that we negotiate what that means, what our commitments, what priorities should be considered, and uh, what values we'd like to, the values that we'd like to promote through our institutions and through our mutual undertakings. Uh, just to recognize the complexity of it then it makes it a process that's constructive rather than one that's imposed. So I think then that is all, uh, if that's, uh, okay, and then we'll, all right, just open it to conversation. Okay, thank you. At this time, uh, we'd like to invite people to come up if you have questions uh, to ask our panelists. <coughs> Dean? Thank, you, thank you, Sam. Uh, Hiram Chodash of the Law School. I have a question for Tony and Ray. So first, for Tony. Uh, anytime we look at law, you, even the most pedestrian rules, uh, since Bob Cover's work, there's always a, a social narrative that informs our understanding of the law. You know, we, we say, we're going to impose a, a traffic light at this intersection. We can imagine in our minds a very basic social narrative that explains why we're putting the traffic light there, even though when we analyze that, we know that there are many considerations of the traffic light, and there may be many harms involved in the traffic light. It may impose costs on enforcement, there may be noncompliance, it may cause uh, the cars to sit there for too long, and so forth. The power of your work is really exposing us to the historical narrative of the Dutch East India kind of paradigm against the sort of more uh, 
I don't know, antiseptic, abstract notion of Westia and Eastia. But I think notwithstanding that, my question to you is how do we choose among competing social narratives? Because certainly in today's world of globalization, sure. the cross-border exchange of information, goods, services, bads, harms, other things, uh, we can imagine lots of those narratives competing and lots in between, people acting uh, in ways that are truly out of power and dominance and others out of their own self-interest just to make money and some out of their own perception of doing good yeah. when they cross a border to suit. So my basic question to you is uh, drawing on your insight against the sort of antiseptic Westia, Eastia yeah. narrative that you've done through your historical research, looking at the present, how do we choose among these competing social narratives? And then a related question for Ray, because I do, I do think it goes to consciousness. That is, what are, how does the imagination fill those patterns in that inform a particular view on policy or value or law? I'm not sure I understood your presentation. I was actually quite shocked by a presentation in today's world on false consciousness. Because when I was even in college, false consciousness, the, the basic view of false consciousness carried a certain almost complete irony uh, that whoever was saying that's false consciousness was himself or herself carried a certain arrogance that they actually knew what true consciousness was. And so I'm kind of uh, really just stunned and also based on my own sort of self-criticism completely confused by how you even begin to get to what you would call true consciousness. So let me get, just give you an example from my world in terms of the things that, I, the kinds of problems I confront. So I do a lot of work on legal system reform. And let me contrast two different views. Uh, there's the view of Tom Carruthers who wrote this book, Democracy Aid Abroad, in which he claimed to debunk a lot of foreign aid models in the legal sphere. Uh, I should note that methodologically he said that he'd been to each of these countries that he studied at least twice, which to me meant that he'd been to at least one of them only twice. <laughs> but putting that aside, he made tremendous uh, mockery of a USAID consultant who was in Romania. And when he asked him what he was doing in Romania, he said he's working with the Romanian court system on forms, on the use of forms. And from Carruthers point of view, he didn't use this term, but this would have been false consciousness because what an absurd thing to have a consultant going to Romania to work on legal forms. And my view of that was that actually that was extremely important work because the work that I do in court systems, if a lot of the court systems I work in had forms such that judges could pick up a file and see what was going on and didn't have to race through tons and tons of documents, that would be a very practical and useful thing. On the other extreme of this, I have a friend, colleague who was in Angola and went into the courts and said, what do you need? A question I should add that very few consultants really ever ask. And she was told in one word, string. String, she asked, how could you use string? She was expecting a much more grandiose kind of set of critiques and ideas. They said, well, it's simple because if you know court systems, documents are kept within the court, in the back office of the court, and those documents are piled up from floor to ceiling, and when there's a storm or an earthquake or even someone who knocks over the piles, <laughs> the documents fall and disperse and get confused, and the documents are held together by what? By string. And so if a court system doesn't have string, can't hold the documents together, they can't be organized, they can't be found when they're needed. And so, again, from a Carruthers type of perspective, or maybe uh, because of the constrained choices that people in that court system have, where they can't afford to think about the grander issues of anti-corruption and judicial independence, maybe string is a falsely conscious priority for them. So how do I reconcile these views? Um, what would be true consciousness? Should I be skeptical of the answer of forms being useful or string being useful just because they're constrained by the basic problematic that people working within that system confront? So thank you for listening to my questions. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Hiram, for a um, very uh, uh, 
well, profound and difficult and searching question. Should I say thanks to that? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but, well, we're a university, I suppose, so you know, we encourage profound, deep, and searching questions. But answering them is a different issue. Um, so uh, let me simply say, um, the, well, the first step, uh, so the question uh, 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 really is, uh, what should be the, inf uh, and I'm simplifying uh, Hiram's question a lot, who was it? Yeah, uh, Sanjay said, answer the question you'd rather answer, I suppose. Um, I, I guess the question is, what vision of justice should inform our practice? In a way, that, that was one way I, I took uh, your question. You know, what is the grand narrative, or what is the narrative that should inform what it is we do? What is the narrative that should inform which laws are better than others? Or what types of um, laws we want to have in place? Uh, so the first thing, um, and I think that actually touches on your presentation as well, Lynette. Um, the first thing I would say is, uh, going back to the Columbus example, one thing we'd like to know is what other people think. So what are their, what are their narratives? So that was the, that's the first step. Rather than say, we've got the answers, here are the answers, and the task that is left to you is to comply with our answers. I suspect that a lot of global governance takes place in the form of the imposition of answers. Not so much in the old-fashioned form of colonialism, but in the new mode of expertise. I think uh, expertise is a concept that we should introduce into the discussion here. Uh, so the second question is, uh, in these circumstances, I think it's important uh, to point to the ways in which we have a narrative and we think that a particular law would help us achieve that narrative, but it doesn't. In fact, the law could contradict what it is that we think we are doing. So I think that's another step. Uh, the third step, uh, I think, is uh, something like, uh, yes, precisely, we have a situation in which there are competing narratives. And this is the situation of the globe, perhaps. We have different visions of justice. And then the question is, how do we nevertheless get along despite these differences? So I think there are some issues which need to be dealt with in that way through negotiation, and perhaps we can see the United Nations as serving precisely that purpose. We don't have a f fundamental idea of justice, but we need to have a system that would enable us to accommodate different visions and make people at least feel that they've enjoyed uh, some sort of procedural justice where they can articulate whatever vision they have, and that can be presented for discussion and debate, and decisions could be made about that. I suspect what is happening in the world at the moment, and this takes us to the issue of the global crisis, is that, in fact, there is some kind of grand narrative in place. And I'm very crude in this respect. But uh, it seems to me that it is the grand narrative of economics and a particular vision of economics and a particular vision of economics and society as being the answer which holds forth. Uh, so it seems to me that that's where we are at the moment um, uh, in some regard. Uh, and uh, perhaps what we need to do is question where that comes from, who articulates it, and how in the midst of this massive crisis, these ideas are still being resuscitated in various ways. Um, and I think uh, this whole question of expertise has a large role to play in this, where the claim is, you need to do this, and we know this because we are uh, economists, or we are whatever it is. Uh, and it's fascinating how, you know, it seems to me this, uh, despite this massive crisis, uh, it's still the same people who are in many ways claiming to be able to fix the crisis which they had created in the first place. Um, and we still give them credibility. It's an astonishing thing to me. And I, don't, I, I wish I knew how to do this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I should quote that last sentence as my answer, mm -hmm. basically. How we give credibility. Well, pe to, to people who basically buy into groupthink, which is what I am trying to contest, you know, this groupthink mentality. I, ca I think I could identify some foundational texts for economic globalization. I could do the same thing for multiculturalism, uh, same thing for migration. There was this very, um, if, uh, again, uh, someone else used the word arrogant, maybe about me, but, uh, you know, I'll throw it at this, uh, this, this letter that was written by the group of eight distinguished Europeans about a year ago, dealing with migration and saying the problem with Europe, and this, uh, some of the European Union commissioners were involved. Uh, Timothy, Timothy Garton Ash, of course, was, uh, was a signee, this very distinguished European. And, um, and, and um, 
And this letter said that what Europeans really need to do, they got to really get their act together and uh, stop, uh, stop being xenophobic and allow even more migrants and treat them even better. Now this is counterproductive. This is simply idiot politics. This is why people vote for Geert Wilders and, uh, and Marine Le Pen and so on. This, this, this type of arrogance on the part of uh, intellectuals who have uh, a false consciousness. False consciousness could be attributed. But I've given the menu of choice. That was the whole idea. Idea that that you could use Bourdieu's idea of misrecognition if, uh, if 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 anything Marxian and as I said Marx actually never used the term false consciousness he used social consciousness uh, Engels used false uh, false consciousness so uh, so uh, the issue of conformity at the present time so very important the issue of public goods and how to uh, how to how to uh, pr promote, uh, promote public good. I think anything dealing with economic globalization as well as multicultural has to be an interest-based analysis. It has to look at the interests that are involved. Uh, one, th one of the things that I really disagreed with, because as I mentioned, I was a criminologist for a long period of time, uh, with, uh, with uh, Richard Falk yesterday was, you know, the impossible happens and communism falls apart. This is a disservice to decades of, of very hard work on the part of dissidents throughout Eastern Europe who risked, uh, oftentimes gave their lives, who organized, who, uh, who, who, who lost jobs, uh, who, uh, who, who, who put so much at risk over a 25, 30 year period to bring communism down. This was spade work that took forever to bring communism down. It is very glib to say that this was the, the impossible happening. That was not the position of, uh, of, 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 of people like uh, Adam Michnik or anyone of a number of uh, major intellectual and, uh, and working class, working class uh, figures in Eastern Europe as, uh, as well. So I think the importance of interest, the importance of agency, the importance of ideological structures uh, that produce, reproduce dominance, all of this is what false consciousness um, should probably have taken second place to. Yes, please. Please step to the mic, please. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Okay. <coughs> My name is Nili Fatshata, and I'm a professor of economics at the University of Utah. I'm also a feminist economist, and I'm post keynesian and so on. Uh, I uh, w wanted to say a few. Uh, things uh, about your presentation on false consciousness and globalization. Uh, as an economist, I take uh, the very important meaning of globalization is imperialism. So it's the expansion of s capital on a world scale, which of course was the definition of Nikolai Bukharin in his book, uh, Imperialism and the World Economy. So classical writers talked about imperialism in this sense, and uh, many of us as economists who are studying globalization look at uh, globalization as another uh, manifestation of imperialism. So in that sense, if uh, one were to go from a kind of a um, Marxian approach, it is not surprising that there would be something called ideology, false consciousness, however you you gave this menu of choices and so on and so forth. So this uh, is something totally consistent with. But what I want to really, uh, and I agree that there is a sense of arrogance when we talk about false consciousness, this is considered very elitist, that because it is uh, generally people who talk about false consciousness are people who are over-educated uh, and therefore they're presuming that they do know what the working class or the so-called subordinate classes or I as a feminist for example should know what poor women on the face of the world uh, should feel and so on. So there is an element of arrogance, there is an element of elitism and so on but I think those elements of elitism and arrogance always are in some ways uh, present in any kind of intellectual position, and that may be highly controversial, but I take that. So one has to risk sounding like that. But my, uh, what, my, what I'm a little bit puzzled about uh, in your uh, presentation, which you said at the beginning, you said uh, talking about false consciousness, uh, we can talk about it, even though its uh, uh, validity is not there. And I think you were talking about, if I didn't misunderstand you, you were talking about sort of 
of Marxism and Marxian analysis in general. Did I misunderstand you? Uh, in that sense. Yes, the, you the, were saying, in, in, in other words, I understood you to yeah. say, even though we cannot sort of uh, see Marxism as a kind of a valid type of analysis, or it's, there is some kind of, ex you used the word external validity, and I'm sorry, I haven't yeah, read your exactly, book. Exactly, so. yeah. Marxism has yeah. no external validity left, but the mm -hmm. concepts, the conceptual to tools right. used, used within Marxism, right. and, and later generations of Marxists might still right. have, have a purpose. They've right. been revised, modernized, right. et cetera, et cetera. My, the bottom line of my comment will be that I agree with you mm -hmm. on false consciousness mm -hmm. for absolutely the opposite reason. Uh -huh. It's because I do think that Marxism has an external validity today <laughs> that one should not be one should not at all uh, be surprised that there is a tremendous ideological, there are tremendous ideological struggles. Uh, there are forms of things that we could call false consciousness or ideology. And when I say I don't agree that Marxism has lost its validity or has disappeared because Marxian analysis it couldn't be more uh, frighteningly relevant than it is today. And in fact, there's a whole book written by many, many uh, scholars, including by one, of course, Terry Eagleton, uh, that's called Why Marx Was Right, and he goes into all kinds of uh, Whether you go into analysis of fetishism of commodities, alienation, false consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, destruction of nature, which of course Marx talked about, and he talked about why that would happen under capitalism. Today, this is called, you know, eco uh, environmentalism and so on. And crises, the most brilliant analysis of crises in capitalism uh, was started out my Marx. So I am not sure why you say that it is not externally valid, because in the analytical sense it's extremely valid, and I can say this with, uh, <laughs> as, a, as an economist who has thought and talked and thought about these and written about these for, for a very long time. So I agree with you on these dimensions of ideology and false consciousness, but it seems that our starting points uh, are, are diametrically uh, opposed. And to the extent that I interpret, and many of us do interpret Mark, uh, economists, interpret globalization as the self-expansion of capital on a world scale in the sense of the classical Marxian writers of, of imperialism, uh, then I think there's a much more consistent story about why we have these narratives which reveal false consciousness and ideology. Thanks a lot. Well, th this is music to my ears. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, I, 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 I have a terrible voice, but I'm, I'm happy to see that somebody <laughs> But I, I, I didn't have a chance to cite uh, Eric Hobsbawm in my presentation, but Eric Hobsbawm is a long, uh, you know, the longest living Marxist in Britain, and uh, uh, he didn't really speak at all in his uh, in his book on on false consciousness, but he did identify it as a, a concept that continues to have use. So. If you want to listen to a very old Marxist coming from Britain uh, and uh, agree with him that uh, certain concepts, including false consciousness, still have a, a value, then I would continue to push this. I, I, you know, I do want I, I do want to try to persuade people uh, uh, with with some of my arguments, and if it has to mean <laughs> sort of eliminating to eliminating the ter uh, something that smacks so much, so much. And I think it was Lenin who was the real arrogant uh, person in terms of false consciousness. He was the, he he, uh, he was he was the one that really talked about trade union consciousness and revolutionary Mao Zedong revolutionary consciousness. So. Uh, so so it, 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 we shouldn't blame Marx for false consciousness having a bad name today. We have, I think we have one person right there. Uh, I have uh, two, two questions. Um, I'm, I'm teaching a peace class right now, and today we discussed the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, which recently uh, went into the area of defining the crime of aggression. And one of my questions is, it, it, do you see humanity ever moving to the point where, where the International Criminal Court would, would uh, condemn aggression such as we saw in Iraq and in other places? Uh, the other question re uh, relates to the myth. Um, one of... One of the interesting discussions I heard last week on National Public Radio is uh, 
Mr. Kagan has written a book about America in its contribution to the world. Uh, and, and this fellow is a, an advisor to Romney in the international arena and also to Clinton. And uh, I've never heard a more explicit uh, defense of American hegemony. He, he basically says the only way we're going to have peace in the world is for America totally uh, to control the world with our military. Uh, like your comment about the mythology of our presidential candidates as well as uh, um, our current president uh, thinking that, that they have to act like Ramble in order to get elected. Is that part of the American myth that the only thing that works is, is power? And it, it looks like almost a, a feedback interaction system between the people who elect these people and the people who want to get elected that, that believe that the only way to get elected is to be, you know, a Rambo, basically, or, or act like one. I, I don't believe Obama necessarily uh, believes in that, but he f probably feels that to get elected he has to, to uh, act aggressive and, and portray a, a vision of aggression. Um, I guess my question on that is, yes. how do we get <laughs> out of that mode? Uh, just on the ICC question, uh, it's, um, it's been a very difficult process, and not just before the ICC. I mean, there were various, in it's a little like defining terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been ongoing international attempts to do that. Um, and uh, uh, it's become complicated because clearly there are certain states that don't want aggression to be defined because their actions would then amount to, well, basically war crimes. Um, and um, so uh, I see it as being a complicated issue, which has been deliberately further complicated and which will remain complicated. Uh, and all sorts of interesting constitutional arguments are made because the argument is something like it's the Security Council that should be dealing with these issues and how does that relate to the ICC and so forth. But I don't see great clarity emerging soon. And, uh, and very and very quickly, a myths of power. I think the, uh, false consciousness wouldn't enter into an, uh, an explanation here. I think it's uh, Rushdie's idea of words and being used to tell um, uh, to tell lies by by politicians, uh, and um, and it reflects. If you really want to talk about consciousness, it reflects you know the real interests of um, the military industrial con uh, complex. Uh, but it, not those of most uh, Americans, as uh, Richard pointed out just uh, an hour or so ago. It's not in the interest of most Americans. And I, I don't think Americans are really being hoodwinked by, by this rumbo rhetoric at the present time. We're almost ready to think we're going to stop electing uh, politicians who vote for the war. Well, the interests, uh, the interests come into play, interests this military industrial, play, this military -industrial uh, set of interests. Uh, we're almost coming to our end, but I know there was one last question, so let me go ahead and take that last question. Uh. Uh, I, I think this is uh, mostly to Tony and really an invitation to talk some more about uh, uh, breaking the hold of a certain cult of expertise uh, uh, that concerns you, but uh, uh, maybe for Ray and Lynette as well, I have a feeling, Ray, you'll think I'm exemplifying false consciousness and some of the things I'll, uh, I'll say. Uh, on, on expertise, it, it seems absolutely right in the areas you were talking about to say that uh, any view of what the course of development uh, uh, should be for a country involves uh, lots of guesswork, is a real bet, and it's the people whose lives are at stake in the bet uh, uh, who should have the most important say as to what bet is taken. On the other hand, call me old-fashioned, and I have no professional stake in this, but I think economists uh, uh, can't live with them, but can't live without them. If one, uh, one wants to learn from the history of uh, success and massive failure in development so far, uh, I can't imagine intelligently learning from that history, deciding what lessons to learn from the mixture of 
government intervention and uh, market incentives in China, uh, except by listening to economists, and that's going to include uh, taking account of uh, uh, their uh, uh, their expertise and grasping and theorizing history. So, okay, so you ag ag agree with that. So, uh, uh, how do you draw the line uh, between common sense and cult in these matters? Uh, again, a, a very difficult question. <laughs> Um, the first thing I would say in terms of expertise is um, there are a different variety of expertises. Uh, so even in the field of eco economics, uh, I think that, and I speak as a non-economist, it seems to me there are different um, ideas, but certain ideas seem to get a particular prominence. Um, even though uh, there are other ideas which could be very important uh, and which could actually be ideas based on real successes. Uh, so for example, it's interesting that, uh, so then we have to look at the whole question of how is status associated with expertise? Like who do we listen to? What are the credentials they should possess when we decide that these are the people whose views are going to be more important than some obscure economist in some university in a developing country who's, who's actually lived in that country and who says actually this doesn't fit in with the experience here. Uh, so I think what you asked for then, Richard, is a sort of more complex issue about uh, you know, how is status attributed in a particular profession? Why are pe people chosen? Why are certain ideas given importance and others not? Even though arguably there are other ideas which also have claims of expertise. I think the second question is really the question of where, where do we draw a line between expertise and politics? Uh, because it seems to me that uh, many of the decisions made in public life uh, are increasingly being made on the basis of technocracy. And uh, those uh, decisions should really be made on the basis of politics, of a community's decisions about who should win or who should lose or what are the costs and how should they be uh, allocated in various ways. So that's, those are just the two things I would say in that regard. Well, this really brings uh, to, at this time the conclusion to our presentation. And the sad part is just when you start getting exciting and the discussion going, unfortunately we run out of time. So if you would please join me in thanking our panel, Mr. Taras, Ms. Seeger, and Mr. Ong for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.